let's get started. So, we are going to finish off chapter one today. Now, before we get into the scripture, I'm just going to quickly take a minute to pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help me today, that you would help me, that you would help us. Lord God, the only times, Father God, that we are changed is when you change us. The only times we can truly hear, the only times we can truly see is when you've opened our ears and you've opened our eyes. Lord God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would do that work today. That we would not leave here today, myself included, the same people we came in. That we would be that little bit more mature, that little bit more loving, that little bit more faithful, a little bit more aware of your presence. Help us today, Father, in the book of Ecclesiastes to understand this wonderful but complicated book. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. So we are in verse 12 to verse 18 today of chapter 1. Verse 12 to verse 18. So if you'd like to just have a quick look there. We're going to start by reading verse 12 to verse 14. I, the preacher, have been king over Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. So let's go back to the start. I, the preacher, that word preacher, as we discussed last week, is the word koheleth in Hebrew. Koheleth means assembler, to assemble, or to gather, or to teach. What Solomon is doing in Koheleth is assembling everyone to say, hey guys, it's all vanity. He's assembling everyone. Koheleth in the Greek translates to ecclesia, which is where we get the word ecclesiastes, which means assembly. So when you're reading ecclesiastes, realize what you're reading is assembly, an assembly of knowledge, an assembly of wisdom to tell everyone, because it's important information in here. King over Jerusalem, Solomon reigned in the land of Israel for about 40 years. We talked about how Solomon wrote three books of the Bible, Songs of Solomon, Proverbs, one of the most famous books of the Bible, and Ecclesiastes. He also built the first temple in Jerusalem and was possibly one of the richest and wealthiest and most powerful people, not just in Israel, but to have ever lived, ever, in history. Um, his, we're going to get into just how rich and powerful he actually was, and it's quite shocking when you realize just how much wealth this guy had. It's quite incredible. Now, one of the things that point me towards him being in an old age at this point is, listen to what he says, I, the preacher, have been king over Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I feel that essence of, I have been king. He's talking about his past. He's talking about his experience. He's looking back over his journey, over his kingship. I have been king over Jerusalem. I can't imagine a young man saying that. He said, I am king over Jerusalem. Yeah? But Solomon says, I have been king, uh, king over Jerusalem. It once again points me towards the fact that he's looking back at his life. And I, I do believe the further we get into this book, the more evident that's going to be. He says, I applied my heart. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. That sentence, applied my heart, we shouldn't underestimate the meaning of that. What Solomon's saying is, I put everything into this. Everything. There wasn't one part of me that I didn't invest into me trying to find out what I wanted to find out. I applied my heart. I put my everything into it. When I read this, it reminded me of Matthew 6, which is the Lord Jesus saying, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, if I was to take in each one of your individual lives the different things that you treasure and trace them back, it would ultimately come back to where your heart is. Ultimately. There are obvious ones like money. It's pretty obvious where the heart is when someone loves money, right? But then there's more subtle ones. Someone who cares a lot about how they look, who cares a lot about their appearance. If you trace that back to their heart, it's probably going to come down to self-esteem, maybe insecurity, maybe ego. 
and etc., etc., etc. Where your treasure is, is where your heart will be also. What you treasure in this life is a representation of what you have applied your heart to. And what Solomon was intentionally doing, intentionally, by the way, is trying to satisfy his heart with as many different treasures as he could. He was dipping in every single type of treasure box you possibly could, trying to find which one was going to fill that void in his heart. But the difference is, is none of them did. Because he was purposefully trying to do this outside of God. He was purposefully trying to find it in the creation instead of trying to find satisfaction in the creator. I mean, how true is that of the world, right? How true is that? How much of creation do we desperately try to find satisfaction on a weekly basis and completely forget that satisfaction can only truly be found in the creator? And this, unfortunately, although necessary, is what Ecclesiastes is all about. It's like Jesus is saying to us, what's your treasure? What's your treasure? You show me your treasure, I'll show you your heart. That's what he's saying to us. He applied his heart to seek out and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Now, a very important part of that sentence, by wisdom. Please don't get it confused. Solomon was not some lad on a joy ride of life try and just willy-nilly enjoy himself. Just, woo, yeah, go, go for it. Just go out partying and all that kind of stuff. That was not Solomon. Listen to what it says. To seek out and to search by wisdom. There was an intentional aspect to everything that Solomon was doing. Solomon, by wisdom, understood, I'm going to do this thing for the objective of trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment there was a purposefulness to his actions he wasn't just some crazed lunatic on a joyride having fun in life there was a purposefulness to what he wanted to do in the big and in the small he looked at the world and he said i'm going to embark on one of the biggest journeys in human history to try and find something that has meaning outside of god i'm going to try he planned it out he mapped it out he covered his steps. He wrote down his findings. And he came to a conclusion and then left the conclusion for people to read. This is as close to a scientific experiment from a spiritual and physical sense than you can get to. There was a purposefulness behind it. It wasn't carelessness. He'd done this by wisdom. And we have to remember from Kings that the Bible testifies about Solomon, he's the wisest person who has ever lived before him, and he's the wisest person who has ever lived after him, apart from Christ. That means, unfortunately, guys, if we believe that the Bible is true, that we do, Solomon was wiser than all of us. All of us. He was more knowledgeable than all of us, and he was more discerning than all of us. <laughs> Mum just pulled a little face. No. <laughs> he is more than... All of us, okay, by wisdom. And he says, I'm come to test all that is done under heaven. Solomon left no stone unturned. The last thing Solomon wanted was someone coming up to him at the end of his life and saying, ah, I know you didn't find satisfaction in any of that, but you didn't try this. No, Solomon tested all that was under heaven. You know, we talk about that a lot. It's come up in quite a few sermons recently. This, this idea of when the Bible says everything, when the Bible says all, when the Bible encompasses, that's what the Bible means. When Paul says, I believe that nothing can come between you and God's love, he means nothing. He doesn't mean something maybe. No, he means nothing. There is nothing in existence that can come between you and God's love. In the same way he says, I have tested everything under heaven. Solomon had the resources, the wisdom, the knowledge and the discernment to actually do that. Many of us would think, Aaron, that's impossible. Never. There's no way this man in his life could have had 
his hand in every type of pleasure in this. There's no way. No, he could. He had the resources, and he actually had the wisdom and discernment to do it. Now, this bit's quite shocking. I, I looked this up, and I, I made sure that it was correct. Experts have taken Solomon's wealth and translated it into current-day wealth. So he, they've taken the gold, the silver, the bronze he acquired. They've taken the different kingdoms he conquered. They've taken everything, and they've put it into today's wealth. And this is going to possibly blow your minds as to how rich this guy was. Solomon's peak net worth was estimated at two trillion dollars two trillion dollars in pounds that's one trillion four hundred and fifty one billion one hundred and thirty million pounds that's how rich this guy was this guy could do anything anything he wanted to buy a city buy it he wanted to build one build it he wanted to take one over take one over this guy was the absolute pinnacle of wealth power knowledge, wisdom. But what's fascinating is he comes at the end of his conclusion. It's all vanity. I love what Rachel shared last week in, a, in, in the discussion moment. She said, Jim Carrey, the famous actor, he said, I wish everyone were as rich as me so they could see it brings you no happiness. It's incredible. I love that. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing that. It's an unhappy business. So we're moving on. Sorry, I'm moving on without you. <laughs> It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. It's difficult, right? We don't want to hear that. It's an unhappy, unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. See, Solomon wasn't an atheist. I've said this last week. Solomon believed in God. He knew God was real. He was just trying to find satisfaction outside of a relationship with him trying to find it once again in the creation. And this is a true statement, by the way. Outside of Christ, this is absolutely true. And I'm going I'm to read to you why. In Genesis 3, verse 17, you don't have to go there, but you can if you want. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, let's read that again. It's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Yes, it absolutely is. We are to work on a cursed ground. The earth is cursed because of sin. Our bodies throughout our life are going to suffer from illness, pains, cramps, sickness, coughs, aches, sores, back pain. The earth will bring us food, but it's going to be through hard labor. It's not going to give it up easily. We're going to have to work for it. We will eat it, but it's going to be by the sweat of our face. We have to work hard in this world to live. Proverbs actually says to the one who doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. We have to work hard in this world. And lastly, we die and return to our original state, dust. Wow, sermon over. See you guys later. Have a great week. That's an unhappy business that God has given us outside of Christ. Now, I want you to imagine something for a minute. I've just read to you Genesis 3, and we're reading Ecclesiastes. Now, imagine for me, really try and do this, that the Bible stops there. Imagine. Imagine if that was it. Genesis 3, you're cursed, and you're going to return to dust, and that's it. And then Ecclesiastes telling you it's all vanity and imagine there's no more scripture. Just imagine that. That's our faith. That's our hope. Imagine the sermon actually did just stop here. See you later, guys. Let's eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Imagine if that was it. If you're able to put yourself in that place, you have just put yourself in the place of every single person who doesn't believe in Christ in this world. 
Because that's it. That's it. For anyone who is not saved in this world, for anyone who does not accept the salvation that Christ has handed them, that is what they have to look forward to. Dust. Death. There is nothing else. You know, in John 10, verse 10, Jesus himself says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Why would Christ need to say that to people who are living? Someone might say to Christ, but Christ, I'm alive. I'm breathing. I've got blood pumping through my heart. I came to give them life and to give it to them abundantly. Well, the difference is, before Christ... A person is walking towards the inevitable, death. In Christ, a Christian is also walking towards the inevitable, life everlasting. Think about that for a second. Your future, regardless of what happens in this world, is inevitably good. (laughs) It's inevitable that you're going to have joy. It's inevitable that you're going to have peace. It's inevitable that he's going to wipe away, just like it says in Revelation, every tear and take away all pain, take you by the hand and walk you through the garden. It's inevitable. So you can counter both sides, just as inevitable as death and sorrow and vanity is for the person who just lives in this world without any comprehension of what is to come. It's just as inevitable as it is for the Christian who lives in this world looking forward to the day they see their saviour again. It's just as inevitable. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. Once again, we have to pay attention to this. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, from the microscopic to the bold and the big. Solomon saw everything that he has done under the sun, everything that is done under the sun, and his conclusion is it is a vanity and a striving after wind. Vanity means emptiness. There is nothing in it. Why? Because death comes and takes it away. And I love this term, a striving after wind. Ben Kente is not here, he's with the teenagers, but he shared a lovely story with me when he was a child growing up in Kenya, they used to chase these um, mini uh, whirlwinds, like these little mini tornadoes when he was a kid. And if anyone knows Ben Kente's son, Judah, I just see little Judah just chasing these things every time I imagine the story. But they, in the desert, used to chase these little whirlwinds. And, and they would be running, running after them, and they would never catch them. But they used to chase after them, but they would never catch them. Just made me think of when Solomon says a striving after wind, chasing something that's not going to work. Now, If your goal is, for example, just going to use one example. Let's say your goal in life is to have a million pounds. That's not a striving after wind. Don't worry, I'm going to explain. Because you can get that. You can get it. If you save enough, work hard enough, get into some real estate or start a business or however, even if you save for 80 years, you can get a million pounds. That's something you can do. You can have that. But that's not the striving after wind part. The physical you can get, the striving after wind is that that physical will never, ever, ever complete what's missing in here. That's the striving after the wind part. The striving after the wind part is when you get that million pounds, two things are going to happen. One, you realize it doesn't make you happy. Two, probably three things. Two, you realize it makes you more stressed. And three, you're going to want more. Because as we read last week, the eye is never satisfied with seeing and the ear is never satisfied with hearing. The stomach's never satisfied being full. The heart is never satisfied with sin outside of Christ. The striving after the wind is what we cannot feel in here. And Solomon had everything physical. Trillions. Still found no satisfaction. Now, why does it seem like only Solomon can see this? Why is it, if this is true, and Ecclesiastes is true in what it's saying, that all is vanity... Why are there not people out there right now just wailing around, crying out, thinking, what is the point? Why? Well, my answer is actually quite simple. Most people, nearly everyone, is still striving for something. Even in this church today. Still striving for something. 
You see, there's one difference between us and Solomon. He had everything. He had all the money you could have, all the power you could have, all the wives you could have, 300 wives and 700 concubines, or the other way around, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Thank you, bro. He had all the women you could have. He had everything you could have. But see, for us, and for everyone out there, that carrot at the end of the stick on the treadmill is still living that lie. Well, Solomon had it, it didn't work for him, but maybe it'll work for me. Maybe if I get a trillion pounds, I'll be happy with it. He just wasn't. Maybe if I get 700 wives, my wife said that's not going to happen, by the way, darling. If, uh, maybe if that happens, maybe then I'll be happy. Maybe if I have it, maybe he just wasn't the right person to have it. It will satisfy my heart. So the reason that people aren't running around the world right now thinking all is vanity is because they're still chasing that whirlwind. They're still chasing that little dust circle that they can never catch. And when they do catch something physical, they find out really quickly it does nothing to satisfy them. Solomon was the only person in history to have had the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to step back from the rat race and say, oh my goodness, none of this works. Oh my goodness, none of this works. I am looking at a world of people on treadmills and not one of them realize. He was the only person who had the know-how to do that. That's why this book is so important. Because in this book, we now have his wisdom, his discernment given to us. Most people read it, they think it's a, a depressing book. No, it's one of the single greatest books for evangelism there ever has been. Because it's to tell the world, guys, I've been there, I've done it, I've had more than you could possibly imagine. I'm desperately trying to tell you, just like Jim Carrey said in that quote, it doesn't do anything. And I'm not going to spoil it, but at the end of this book, he has a lovely testimony. He brings it full circle. It's God. It's God. And I'm not going to go there right now, so I don't want to spoil the ending. <laughs> there is one thing that Solomon couldn't see. There is one thing that Solomon couldn't see for all of his wisdom, for all of his discernment, for all of his knowledge, and for all of his power. The spiritual. Solomon could not see what is unseen. We were talking in the Bible study. I told you, ladies, it was going to come up this week. We were talking in the Bible study about how the Bible says about the gospel, about Jesus Christ's salvation, that before he came, the angels longed to find out what we now know. Think about that for a minute, by the way. Angels in heaven longed to know what was going to happen in the future with Jesus Christ and salvation. Solomon had no idea. For all of his wisdom, for all of his discernment, he could never have seen God's plan for us in the future. And I would go as far to say, and I really do mean this, that I do truly believe if Solomon was to stand at this pulpit, knowing what we know now, it's not that he would contradict his own book because everything he's saying is true. But I believe he would have a fantastic sermon about, but in Christ, there is satisfaction. In Christ, there is satisfaction. Verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. What is crooked cannot be made straight. This is true, once again, outside of God. How many generations of people have we had who have tried to make this world a better place? How many generations of social justice movements, climate movements now, and so many other movements have tried to make what is crooked straight, what is sinful, unsinful, what is bad, good? How many people have tried? I would go to as far as say that the world has only got worse, not better. No one's been able to do it. No one has been able to make what is crooked straight. Outside of God, it is impossible. It is impossible to make true, eternal, permanent change. I, I used to work, I've just re resigned uh, recently because of taking on the pastor role. I'll still be volunteering there. But I used to work for um, a charity. I was a youth worker. We look after young people. And we'd go into schools and we'd have people, young people who are in prison and they'd come and visit us, etc., etc. And we would, we would go and see these guys and we would invest into their lives and we would do this stuff and we would feel so passionate about our work. We want to help these kids, right? 
But towards the end of my career, can I tell you the most frustrating thing? Is Christ was never brought into it. Let's say I help that kid. Let's say I get him into college. Let's say I get him into university. Let's say he doesn't do crime anymore. Let's say he walks the right walk and he lives his life and has a lovely family. Fantastic. Let's say that kid never finds Christ and dies. What have I accomplished? Okay, but his life here was better, Aaron. No, what have I accomplished really, truly? He's dead. It was all vanity. The only way I can save these kids, the only way I can help these kids is by pointing them to the one who can make what is crooked straight. It is impossible for a human being to make what is crooked straight. It is not our job to try. It is our job to point the world to the one who can. Sometimes as a pastor, you'll have this, um, this strange thing, especially when I've gone to other churches, people come up to me and say, oh, my auntie needs to hear that sermon. If she hears that sermon, you've just preached it, it's done deal. My brother, he's unsaved, and I just think if you could speak to him, if you could speak to him, and I'm thinking, you've got 40 other people in the congregation, what? No, no, pastor, if you could speak to him, it would just change their lives. No. You bring someone who's an unbeliever into this church and you tell me beforehand, here's what I'm going to do. Blimey, we better pray about it. (laughs) We better pray for them. We better go to the one person, the one individual in this world who can actually change them, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have a part to play. I'm not saying that God won't use you to reach people, but notice what I just said. God won't use you to reach people. The Bible says in Romans how the importance of preaching. It says, how will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? But this next bit, how are they to preach unless they are sent? It starts with God, the work is with God, and it finishes with God. God is the only one in this whole entire universe who can make what is crooked straight. He done it for us. He can do it for them. What is lacking cannot be counted. If I was to ask you guys to just start to think about what is lacking in this world, I'm pretty sure we would, we would probably be a little bit overwhelmed. When I think about famine in the world, the food that's lacking, when I think about the extreme poverty in the world, when I think about health, when I think about homes, when I think about clothes, and they're just physical things, then I think about morality, love, care, patience, goodness, kindness. What's lacking in this world is beyond our comprehension. We could sum it up by saying what's lacking in this world is Christ. Yes, you're right. But if we were to look individually at what's lacking, even though it's all in Christ, it's beyond comprehension. It's beyond comprehension. But when I read that, I thought to myself, do you know what? Yes, okay, we can all say what is the world lacking. That's the easy part. What is the church lacking? What is the church of God in this country lacking? Unity. There are so many different interpretations. So many different denominations. Everyone has a different view, a different understanding. Well, pastor, that's how you say it. I see it like this. Oh, so God meant two things, did he? Three, four, five, six, seven. Servanthood. A servant-like mindset in church in this country is missing. Many people come to church to be fed and never to feed. Many people come to church to be served and never to serve. To have their feet washed and never to get their hands dirty. There is a lack of servanthood. There's a reason Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Do you want to know why? Because laboring is hard work. And a lot of people don't want to do it. They'd rather just sit back and watch the others do it. The few who do stand up and say, I'm here, Lord, send me. Love in the church is lacking. A lack of love is the reason for many of these other things. A lack of love can lead to a lack of servanthood. A lack of love can lead to a lack of unity. A lack of love is pretty much the overall umbrella of how we see all the different other problems happening in churches today. A lack of love. And I'm not talking about human love. I'm talking about agape love. True, sacrificial, God-like love 
that esteems you above me and you esteem me above you and that's how we love each other. That's lacking. Faith. I mean, the cornerstone of our salvation, faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. How is faith lacking in the church? Well, in Revelation, or not Revelation, sorry, the Lord says, when I return, will I find any faith on earth? Is that not the scariest verse you have ever heard as a Christian? What did you just say, Lord? Sorry, Lord, say that again. When I return, will I find any faith on earth? But Lord, I'm right here. Now, I hope it's because we've been raptured. <laughs> Truly, I hope it's because the church has been raptured and when he returns, he finds no faith on earth. Because if it's anything but that, my goodness, what state is the church going to be when he gets here? We lack faith. A willingness to suffer. We live in a very comfortable country with very comfortable lives. And a lot of the things that we suffer in to people across the world would be nothing but minuscule problems. And I don't want to say that your suffering isn't important. It is because it's relative. I'm just saying there are people in the world who don't know what they're going to eat today. And there are people in the world being tied up for their faith and cast off the tops of buildings because they're Christians. And we're going to leave and go home to our houses with our nice clothes on. We're comfortable. A willingness to hold fast to the truth. The Methodist Church is the fourth biggest denomination in the entire world of Christians. The fourth biggest denomination. Two months ago, they handed out a legislation saying that it is now no longer sin to marry a gay couple together. Two months ago, they handed out a legislation saying basically we accept gay marriage and that we do not accept what the Bible has said about it. They are the fourth biggest denomination in the entire world of Christians. Millions of Christians. The world is going to put pressure on you as a Christian to not hold fast to the truth. What does Romans 1 say? They say what is bad is good and what is good is bad. And they tell others to do the same. We are meant to be the blockade which stand and say, no, I will not accept that. But my goodness, will they put you under pressure to do so. Get ready for that. Prepare yourselves for that. Because we are living in a world that is going to get worse and worse, harder and harder, to proclaim that this is true. A servanthood among leaders. What is lacking? A servanthood among leaders. Leadership is one of the most precarious and dangerous positions to be in in the church. For two reasons. One, Satan has a bullseye on your forehead. Because the, because the Bible says if you, make the shepherd, uh, if you get the shepherd, the sheep will scatter talking about Christ and also talking about the under-shepherds as well. So if you kill the leader, the sheep will scatter. Why? Because there aren't many servants to take over. But for a second reason, pride, ego. You stand at this pulpit week after week and people look at you and they, they come to hear you speak. And then afterwards they come to you and they say, Pastor, pray for me, or Pastor, I need your help in this. And you start to feel a little bit inflated. You start to feel a little bit important, like you're more chosen than everyone else. And among leaders across the country and across the world, this has happened in churches. In fact, it's actually led to many churches being destroyed and many, many people being hurt, generations of people being hurt. Now, my prayer is, and I believe that God is able to do this, that if God is able to sustain the apostles to remain humble their entire life and is able to sustain Stephen to remain humble and Moses and Noah, I believe and pray that God is able to keep me in that same place, keep Ben Kente in that same place, keep Mike in that same place. I believe that. I believe God can sustain us in that. But it is still dangerous. A servant-like attitude among leaders is needed. Jesus said, the greatest among you shall be the servant of all. True worship towards God, spirituality, a true worship towards God. God says, they worship me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. How many people turn up to churches every single Sunday because they have to? Because it's part of their tradition. Worship because they have to, not because they want to. Spiritual warfare, all but dead. Ministry of deliverance in this country, in our comfortable Western society, is all but gone.
There was a time in the early church where these things were normal, to pray for someone to be delivered or to pray for bondage to break or to pray for chains to break. That was completely normal, completely standard. But if someone stands up here today and does it, every single one of us are like, whoa, what are you doing? I know it says it in here, but I don't want to practice it. That scares the life out of me. I don't know too much about that. Just keep that over there, yeah? And godliness. All of it really summed up. What is the church lacking? Godliness. Godliness. Maturity. Godliness. How do we make up what is lacking then? After this long list, how do we make up what is lacking in the church? Well, let me ask you a question. Who can make what is crooked straight? Jesus. I can't make up what is lacking in this church. You can't make up what is lacking in this church. We can't do it for the churches across the world. Only God can. But there is a part that God gives us to play in it, and it's a beautiful part. Listen to what James chapter 4, verse 8 says. And this, for me, is the epicenter, maybe, of this sermon today. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. <laughs> That's crazy. A lot of people want to say that's impossible. No, Aaron, it isn't about how devoted you are. God doesn't spend more time with you because of your devotion. No, listen to what James 4 says. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We're not talking about a works-based salvation here. The person's already saved. It's about where their treasure is. God draws near to the person who draws near to him. See, God, isn't, God doesn't want robots. God doesn't want a remote control to control us and bring us to prayer. If you don't want to spend time with God, you may be saved, but if you don't want to spend time with him, he's not going to grab you by the neck and force you. <laughs> but if you want to wholly devote yourself to God, if you want to spend every waking second with him, if you want to seek him every single day, guess what? He's going to be right there with you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, I ask you, if every single one of us in the church individually had this as a permanent scripture in our minds every time we woke up every day, if every single one of us individually had this in our minds, what would happen to us communally? What would happen to us communally if every single person drew near to God every single day and every single day God drew near to them and then we came to meet on a Sunday and boom. That is how you make up what is lacking in the church by drawing near to God. By drawing near to God. Your devotion to God should not just be on a Sunday. Sunday Christians are not what we are looking for. The word Christian means follower of Christ. That's what the word Christian means. For anyone who calls themselves a Christian doesn't know what the word Christian means. It means follower of Christ. Not just on a Sunday. Monday to Sunday. 24-7. Not to earn your salvation. Your salvation is brought alone by the blood of Christ. But to be wholly devoted to the work that he has for your life. That's how we get more servants in the church. Drawing closer to God. Let's carry on. Verse 16, I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who are over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. So he said, I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know badness and folly. I perceive that this also is a striving after wind. I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over me in Jerusalem. Now, that's, not, that's, not, that's only half the truth. The Bible takes it one step closer. It says, not only have you surpassed everyone before you were in Jerusalem, the Bible actually says about Solomon, you've surpassed everyone after you in wisdom as well. In Kings, it says, everyone after Solomon. No one like him has ever come since. So Solomon only understood half the truth. The other half of his life, the, the future for him, was just as glorious in wisdom and knowledge as the past. He was more knowledgeable, more wise than anyone before and anyone after. Now this part, I applied my heart to know wisdom, and this is interesting, to know madness and folly. Hmm. Remember when he says I applied my heart? He means I chucked myself into it. Fully fledged. Chucked myself into it. But here's what he's saying, and this is so important. To know wisdom and to know madness and folly. Folly means foolishness. 
Folly means foolishness. Here's what Solomon's saying. Guys, I've tried both. I've tried both. I've gone down the route of intelligence and discernment and knowledge, the academic route. But when I saw that that brought me no satisfaction, I've also gone down the foolish route, the mad route, just living life purely off my sinful pleasure. My flesh just just telling me what to do on a daily basis. I've lived that life as well. By wisdom, I've explored what it is to be a fool. I've explored what it is to be mad. Guess what? Both of them did nothing for me. The, the life of foolishness, what would we think about that? Well, one example I would say is this. I was out last night in the cinema with my, with my family, and you, as we were driving through Epsom, you see lots of people out partying, right? It's quite late at night when we were driving back, people getting drunk and people in clubs. Now, is it wise to drink so much that the next day your body rejects it and you feel awful? Is that wise? Like, at a basic logical level, <laughs> think about it logically, <laughs> Does it make sense to put a substance in your body that makes your body vomit and feel terrible? That's pretty flipping foolish, if you ask me, right? It doesn't make any sense on a logical level. That would be the way of foolishness. That would be folly. Solomon tried it. Solomon tried it. And everything that came with it. And it did nothing for him, just as wisdom did nothing for him. Outside of God. Now, later on in Ecclesiastes, Solomon does go on to say that to have wisdom is more beneficiary than to be a fool because it protects you from more calamities. But then straight after he says that, he still says both are a striving after wind. Even his own wisdom and knowledge didn't satisfy him. And this guy was the most knowledgeable and the most wise. I perceive that this also was a striving after wind. Some people want to be the smartest person in the room. Some people want to acquire the most knowledge. And some people just want to have fun, regardless of whatever it means, just to go out and be a lad or or be a lass and just enjoy life. Solomon says they are both striving after wind. You're never going to catch what it is your heart is trying to find. It's always going to evade you. Now, what's interesting about this is where does wisdom come from? Where does knowledge come from? Well... Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1, verse 7 says, The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Now, if you leave God out of it and simply refer to him as Elohim, and you leave that fear of God, what is wisdom and knowledge going to bring you? Nothing. It's going to be of no benefit to you. Now, I don't want to undermine Solomon. But at the end of his life, did he have much fear of God? Think about what he did. He committed the one travesty in Israel that God hated the most. To raise up false gods made of stone and wood and encourage in all of his power people to worship them. What? This is the same guy who worshipped and loved God in his youth. That's why I believe Proverbs was written in Solomon's youth. I don't believe it was written in his old age. I believe this book was written in his old age because there is a distance between Solomon and God. Do you know in the book of Proverbs, when it refers to God, when Solomon's writing, it says Yahweh, Jehovah, Saviour, Lord. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, it just says God. Just Elohim, God. Something's happened there. Between Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, something has happened in Solomon's life where there is now a distance. If you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. So what is the opposite of that? He lost his fear of God, followed his lustful desires to the end, looked back at his life and realized none of it did anything for me. What a waste of time. And when we get to the end of Ecclesiastes, we're going to see his true conclusion about life, which I really am looking forward to. If you leave God out of wisdom, if you leave God out of knowledge, they become just as much vanity as everything else in creation outside of God. 
I remember being, uh, uh, I was saved, when I was first saved at 21, I, I was saved in a, uh, I gave my life to Jesus in a, in a church called Hillsong. Many of you have probably heard of Hillsong. Um, a bit surprising for me to be here right now preaching like this if I come from Hillsong. Um, but I gave my life to the church in Hillsong, and I remember going to a Hillsong conference. And I, I don't want to, I'm kind of estimating the numbers here, but I, I know that in the O2 arena, I don't know how much the O2 arena can hold. I know it's thousands upon thousands upon thousands. This place was heaving, yeah, full, to the brim. Like, you couldn't sit down at this Hillsong conference. And I remember them calling up the main guy, top guy, the guy who created Hillsong, the top Australian guy, uh, and he was the top, top Don, right? And they called him to the stage. He sat in this seat, hundreds of thousands of people looking at him. And the guy was doing a Q&A in front of all these people to this top guy, top guy in Hillsong. And this is what they asked him. Oh, I heard you can do that amazing trick. Could you recite the 66 books in order? And in front of hundreds of thousands of people, this top guy in Hillsong began to recite very, very quickly Genesis. And he got to the end. And they were, ooh, And then the guy said, oh, guys, it gets better. He can do it backwards. Revelation Jew, do, 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 do. and he done it backwards in front of hundreds of thousands of people, and everyone got up, woo, cheer, yeah. What? All that knowledge means absolutely nothing if you don't know God. I don't care if you've memorized every single word in the Bible. I don't care. If you don't know God, it means nothing. Nothing. Let me tell you your pastor's testimony. I went through the Bible the other day, came across the book of Nahum and forgot it was in there. That's true. I was reading the Old Testament. I came across the book of Nahum and thought, oh my goodness, I forgot the book of Nahum was in there. And I read it and was blessed. I'm not saying don't memorize scripture. Do memorize scripture. But don't do it to try and satisfy some need to memorize scripture. Do it to better remember God. Do it to better your worship of God. Do it as devotion to God. Don't do it as some need to be intelligent or knowledgeable or to be able to say to people, I can do this. Do it because you love God. Knowledge and wisdom, even of this amazing book, is useless if you do not know the God who made it. It's just as vain as creation. And I love this book. But I love it because I love God. And I know he wrote it. It's so important. At the end, verse 18, for in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Solomon was in a strange predicament that not many of us, if any of us, will ever, ever find ourselves in. He could see the truth behind it all. Even though we're going through the book of Ecclesiastes, to some element, to some degree, we will still be, to some element, chasing a little bit of that carrot in our lives. Over time, God will mature us and take us off that treadmill bit by bit. But even now, today, there is still an element of every single one of us that has a carrot, that has a striving after wind. Solomon was in a position, the only human in history apart from Christ, who could truly step back and say, oh my goodness, I see it for what it is, vanity. Outside of God, I have actually had the revelation of what this life is. Outside of God, it is vanity. For in much wisdom is much, ve much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. And that can be true for Christians as well. The more we learn about Christ, and what he's done for us, the more we learn about God and how, how much he loves us, the more we learn about this Bible, believe it or not, this can be true for us because it, it increases our sorrow and our vexation when we look out to the world and just say, I wish you would get it. I wish you would listen. When you have family and loved ones and people you care about and you desperately want them to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved and see what this is all about, really, it increases your vexation. It increases your sorrow when you look and see people just walking towards the inevitable. In Sodom and Gomorrah, when Lot saw the sin, it says it grieved his righteous soul every single day. 
every day he woke up in that city, he looked at the city and he was just depressed because he knew the truth. And none of these guys would listen. So it can, it can actually do this very thing. It can make us vexed and it can increase our sorrow. Knowing more and more and more just shows how little or how lost people actually are. So it is true. Now, like last week, I said this at the end of last week's sermon, it's a hard book to turn around at the end of the sermon and say, and this is how it applies to your life. It's a hard book to do that. Because what I'm really trying to accomplish here, what I'm really trying to accomplish, and I'll be very transparent about it, what I'm trying to accomplish is showing each one of you and myself how outside of God, it's all pointless. And by the time we're done with this book, there should be one thing and one thing only that has been completely increased in our lives, and that is our devotion to God. Because when you understand and when you come to the revelation that the only thing I do in this world that matters is what I do for God, then you will spend nothing else in your life, you'll never want to do anything else in your life apart from what you do for God. That is what we're aiming for. That is what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about to set you on fire for people out there to go out there and say, guys, look, it says it here. I know you want that. I know you want to be rich. I know you want to be clever. I know that you want success. I know you want a promotion. I know you do. I know you do. But listen to what the guy who had it all said. Listen to what Solomon said. Please, please, please understand. It's emptiness. It's vanity. Let me show you someone who said, I come to give you life and life abundantly. Jesus Christ gives us the meaning of life. Jesus Christ is the meaning of life. Why am I on this planet? Jesus Christ is why you're on this planet. You were born to have a relationship with God. In Genesis He says, be fruitful and multiply. And they were in that garden with God, walking around with God, in communion with God, in fellowship with God, talking to God, seeing God. They were born for one purpose, for God to pour out his love on them and for them to look at him and for them to have a relationship. A father, a son, a father, a daughter. That is the purpose of your life. And if you are living any other life outside of that, then you have completely missed the meaning of why you're here. That's the truth of the gospel. And it goes further because that father in heaven loved his children so much that when they went astray, he died for them to bring them back through Jesus Christ. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves them. He gave his life to bring them back into that place in the garden, back into that relationship, because that is the meaning of life, to have a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's it. 